All right, folks, welcome back. It's time for our next Mark 262 cloning video. It's been a long time since we've done one of these, about a year and a half. For those of you who weren't around back then, or maybe you forgot what the heck we're talking about, we're trying to clone this stuff right here. This is the Black Hills 77 grain OTM. The military uses this, and it's designated Mark 262 Mod 1. It uses the 77 grain Sierra Match King with a can lure and the velocities are really high. I try not to be a safety nag all the time, but this is one where it's definitely appropriate. Every load I'm gonna to shoot today is going to be over published max, especially 223 published max. This is a really hot rod, 5.56 round, and cloning its performance should be approached with extreme caution. So like I said, this is the 15th video, did I mention that? I get asked all the time whether the series is over or when the next video is gonna come. The series is never gonna end. The reason why we haven't had a video in a long time is I've kind of run out of powders that I think will hit the velocities we need to duplicate this round. With my old 18 inch White Oak Armament SPR barrel, 2750 feet per second is what we hit. I recently got a new barrel for my 223 AR. It is the White Oak Armament Predator that's a 20 inch barrel. I've only got a couple hundred rounds through it and we've shot a few of the Mark 262 clone loads in it. And I think we're, we're getting about an additional 50 to 75 feet per second, depending on the powder. So 2,800 to 2,825 is kind of our target in the new barrel, as far as I know. That's another reason for today's video. I wanna put some more rounds through this new barrel. I don't have confidence in it yet. Our tests up to this point have been kind of okay. The groups aren't quite matching up with what we came to expect from the 18 inch barrel, kind of overall. In this Mark 262 series with the old barrel, the factory ammo shot about a 0.7 inch group, if I'm remembering correctly, and as we tested loads, the good ones we found, when we, when we hit upon a good combination, we were seeing groups between 0.5 and 0.7 inches. So very good shooting combo in the 18 inch barrel. This 20 inch barrel has a different chamber though. It's got, uh, I forget what White Oak calls it. It's their, it's either their varmint chamber or their predator chamber. I can't remember what they call it, but it's got a little bit shorter throat. So things are just a touch different. I wanna put some rounds through the gun today, see how it's shooting, and while we're at it, I wanna bring a couple new powders into this series. The first is Winchester Stable 6.5. I'm not sure we're gonna get there as far as velocity goes. We're probably gonna run out of case capacity. Now on the Hodgson website, they've got load data for this powder for a pretty wide range of uh, bullet weights in 223, but they've, they've got the 77 grain Sierra Match King, they've got the 80 grain and the 90 grain Sierras. So with the 77 grain bullet, they do, they do show it being a compressed load with a max charge of 26.8. And their listed pressure, it looks like they were able to hit max pressure with the load. But the velocity numbers lag a little bit behind CFE 223 and BLC2, which they're a little bit faster burning than Stable 6.5. The charge weights are two, yeah, around two grains of powder less than Stable 6.5. So this one, this one just might be a little bit too slow burning, a little bit too bulky to get enough into the case to get up to the velocities we're looking at or we're looking for. Now, if we compare that to the 90 grain Match King load data they've got, Stable 6.5 catches up and passes both CFE 223 and BLC2 in velocity. So if you're shooting 90s, if you got a rig where you're shooting 90s or 95s then this is probably gonna be a really good velocity option for you. But we're gonna see how, you know, how high we can get here with the 77 grain Match King. I'm also curious, you know, what sort of accuracy we're gonna get. We're still in the early days here with Stayball 6.5. It just came out a couple months ago. We've done a little bit of accuracy testing with it in 22250. The results weren't awesome. Standard deviations weren't that great. You know, the velocity was a little bit all over the place with most combinations we tried but hopefully it'll be good here in this application. The two, the other two powders I was just talking about, CFE 223 and BLC2, both of those powders were able to hit our velocity target in this series, but both of them really just did not shoot very well and they had high standard deviations of velocity and they definitely didn't make our favorite powders list for this series, which if you wanna go back, I mean, we're up to, we've tested probably almost 20 powders. I've got a separate playlist just for this series of videos. So if you're interested, go back and check them out. This has been a really fun series with some really good shooting loads and a lot of surprising results. And I guess I should say, like I mentioned, Stayball 6.5 is kind of the main one we're, we're gonna to test today. 
and add to the list. If I've missed powders that should be included in this series, you let me know because I enjoy making these videos. Another powder that I haven't shown in this series is Shooter's World Match Rifle. I did do a separate video just on this powder and we shot this combination. We shot the 77 grain Sierra Match King and it was able to reach the velocities we needed for a Mark 262 clone load. So I'm gonna shoot it here in this video, but I already know what my charge weight needs to be. So we're not gonna do like kind of a full velocity workup on it since the job's already done. Shooter's World Match Rifle is extremely close to accurate 2520, which has been an impressive powder in this series. And it's hard to track down the, the history of some of these powders sometimes. You never know who's speculating and who's giving you good information, but my understanding is that Accurate 2520 used to be the same thing as Shooter's World Match Rifle, which is the, the same as the Lovix 0, I think it's D073-06. And this is made in Czech Republic. But I think for some reason, Western Powders moved on to other suppliers of basically a clone of this powder. Right now, this is made in the US of A. So different countries of origin. They're definitely not exactly the same, but man, they're super duper close. So Shooter's World Match Rifle is a good option to try if you're looking to clone Mark 262. The other thing I noticed as I was getting prepped for this, this old box, you know, this is the same box of 50 that we started the series with. There are still five unfired shots. So we're going to fire these today and, you know, get a new baseline as far as velocity and pressure signs and, you know, all of the stuff we do or we did way back in the first video to see how this stuff shot in our original 18 inch barrel. So I've pulled out five of my favorite powders from this series. So we'll call this kind of the verification loads. So we're gonna shoot five pieces of the factory ammo and then we're gonna shoot these five loads. Vitavori N540 was extremely impressive whenever we tested it. AR comp was pretty awesome. It's very close to, to pressure though, if I'm remembering correctly from our AR comp tests. We're kind of pushing AR comp a little harder than I wish we were. And the same thing goes with the next powder, 8208 XBR. I include them here because they've traditionally given us the best accuracy we've seen in this series, I believe. And backing these guys off a couple tenths or a half grain or something would give us, you know, virtually the same performance with better brass life and all of that stuff. But we're gonna shoot them here at the listed charges. The next one, uh, Shooter's World Match Rifle. We're gonna shoot 25.2 grains. And if you remember back from the earlier videos, Accurate 2520, it's kind of funny because the name is the charge weight. 25.2 grains of Accurate 2520 has been what we've shot and found to be our clone load. And it's the same charge with Shooter's World Match Rifle. The last one is from, I think our last video in this series, and that's Power Pro Varmint. It shot very well, it was very impressive. And it's another one that is very close to 2520 and Match Rifle. And you'll see the charge weight is barely different, 24.8 grains, right around that 25 grain mark. So those are our verification loads. For Stayball 6.5, we're basically gonna shoot as much as we can fit in the case. It's gonna get compressed pretty hard, most likely. So I haven't done that testing yet, so what you're seeing on the screen here is what we end up going with. I wanna load up five, charge, uh, five different charge weights, but I basically wanna see how much I can jam in the case and then drop back from there in three tenths of a grain increments. Uh, you know, not exactly the smartest thing to do here, but we're not gonna be able to fit much more than Hodgton's max charge of 26.8 grains was their max. I don't think we're gonna be able to fit all that much more into the case. So we'll see how it goes. You're more informed than I am. You can see the charge weights we went with there on the screen. Our primers are going to be CCI number 41 primers. The bullet, of course, is the 77 grain Sierra Match King with a cantalure, part number 9377G. For brass, we are going to be shooting brand new Lake City brass. With the new barrel and the new gun and all that stuff, I kind of need to break in a new batch of brass and that's what we got going on here. This is Lake City 2018 head stamps and it is brand new. So no primer crimps or anything like that to deal with. It's totally virgin brass. Does that cover it? We're gonna stick with the old goofy overall length that we've shot throughout this series, 2.243 inches. I usually like to round these things off or in the case today where Stayball 6.5, we really need all of the case capacity we can get to get more powder in there. I would generally stretch it out to 2.260, but back in the early days when we were analyzing the 
Mark 262 ammo. That's the overall length we found. So this is a clone series, so we're just gonna stick with it. So I think that's pretty much it. This brass has already been fully prepped. I ran it through a full length sizing die. I deburred the flash holes. That's one thing, Lake City brass, it's fantastic stuff, but it generally has some gnarly burrs on the flash holes. So I like to deburr those and then chamfer and deburr the case mouth. And I've already installed the CCI 41 primers. I'm ready for powder and bullets. A lot of different powders in play here. So I wanna focus on not making any mix ups. And plus watching me weigh out powder is pretty boring. So I'll see you guys at the bullet seating die and we'll determine what max charge we wanna shoot with Stayball 6.5. I'll kinda of walk you through what I'm gonna go through there. So I've been trying to decide what seating die to use. We've used several in the series, including this Forster Ultra Micrometer seating die. You can see in its package right now, I've got it all torn apart. We've had problems with the seating stems a little bit and we've cracked one. I believe this one right here is actually cracked. So we're, we're just gonna bypass the Forster. Now in the last year and a half since we made our last video, I really started using the Hornady custom grade dies a whole lot because you can get a pretty cheap micrometer adjuster thing to go on top of them and they have a variety of seating stems you can buy for them. So I was hoping one of the 223 or 22 caliber stems I've got would be a decent fit for this bullet. That one, yeah, this is the original that came with it. That's not particularly good. And this is a this is a stem that's for the 75 and 80 grain ELD match bullets from Hornady and it's not really a very good fit either. So I think we're gonna bypass the Hornady and we're just gonna stick with what we've used most in this series, which is my standard Redding 223 seating die. If we pull out the seating stem from this dude, yeah, there it is, and drop a bullet in this guy, it is an excellent fit. Like it is a really, really good fit. Now this matters a lot today, right? Because we're shooting some heavily compressed loads a, a seating stem fit like this is going to be able to deal with those heavily compressed loads without causing rings around the bullet nearly as bad. If you've got a poorly fitting seating stem where your contact area between the seating stem and the bullet is very small, you know, it concentrates all that force in a small area and you end up with, with bullet deformation problems. And that's not what we want. Uh, I don't remember how to set this die up. Eh, I tell you, the safe bet will just run an empty case up into the die and we'll screw it down until we feel it touch. There it is right there. So that's the crimp. You know, the standard seating die does have a crimp in it. That's the crimp hitting the case mouth. So let's back it out from there one full turn and we'll lock it down because we don't want to we don't want to crimp with the seating die. You can. Nothing wrong with it. We're just not doing that. That's not how we've done it so far in this series. I hate this knob on this Lyman press that I've been using, it always ends up in the way of what I'm trying to show. All right, so I've, I've measured out five charges with Stayball 6.5, starting with the maximum charge in the Hodgson load data of 26.8, and I'm going up in uh, three tenths of a grain increments. So our heaviest charge here is 28.0. So I just wanna go through and seat these five and see how they feel. They're all gonna be compressed, but I think once we move up, we're gonna run into problems where it's just too much seating force. Maybe even with a decent uh, fitting seating stem, we're gonna start getting rings around our bullet or form, uh, deformations. That's what we wanna avoid. So let's start out with the first one here and use it to set up our die, which is pretty easy here. We've got a cantalure on the bullet and we know that at our target overall length, that cantalure is lined up pretty decent with the case mouth. So we can make a few quick adjustments before we have to pull out our calipers. A little bit more, a little bit more yet. We're at about the bottom of the cantilever. That's still gonna be a little bit long. All right, let's uh, switch to taking some measurements. We're at 2.279, so we've got nearly 40, 40 more thousands to go. Oh, and I just remembered with this die, so my seating stem just bottomed out. Let's go ahead and seat it there and see what number that gives us. So we're gonna to have to screw the whole die in a little bit more to get to uh, regain a little bit of adjustment room with our die and we're so close, but we're still a little bit long, 2.262. So let me crack this die loose again. There it is. And we'll take it down 
uh, a little bit less than a half turn. So we're still, our crimp should still be about a half turn away from our case mouth. So let me back out the stem a little bit and we'll run this one up in there and then I can screw it down until I feel it touch. There it is, a little bit more. So let's see what that gives us. 2.257, 2.249. And also if we look at our cantilever alignment, if you can see that, our cantilever, a top, top of our cantilever is just barely above the case mouth. So we know that's just about right. I'll tell you what, let's, I'll tell you what, let's give it one more little tweak and then really try and tighten it down here. All right, that might give us another thousandth or two, but then again, maybe not. Yeah, 2.248. Now from all of that repeated seating and adjustments and stuff, you might see a little bit of a kind of a scuffed up area there around there where we got our primary seating stem contact, but definitely no deformation of the bullet or any sort of actual, you know, damage or problems. So let's move on and seat all five of these. Here is the second one, which is 27.1 grains. It doesn't feel, you know, too bad. I expect our overall length to be growing as we go. Yep, 2.257. Let's go ahead and do the third one at 27.4. 2.254. I'll pull out the bullet comparator here in just a minute and we'll get some numbers from cartridge based O jive, which will clarify the situation a little bit. Because these, you know, hollow point match bullets like this have some variation in their, you know, their me plat, the, the tip of the bullet that will result in varying overall length numbers. All right, at least with that, with that basic bullet seating setup, this is 28.0 grains, not seeing any bullet deformation or problems caused by the seating stems. So that, that's outstanding news. Now here's our Hornady bullet comparator. Yep, with our 22 caliber insert in there. Let's get some cartridge based ogive measurements. So our lightest charge here, 26.8, is 1.895. It's a long 1.895. We might call it 1.896. So moving up three tenths of a grain, 1.899. So it's stretched out three thousandths. Yeah, the next one is 1.899. So what we might've seen with that first one, remember that's the one we used to adjust our seating die and we seated the stupid bullet 15 times. Sometimes you'll see that kind of end up giving you a funky, a funky number. Yeah, I think that's what happened because here's, here's our next one is 1.900 and the last one is 1.901. So we're getting very manageable, you know, uh, stretch here, but I really need to go down just a little bit more. So here's our last charge, 28, 0 grains is at 2.261. So I need to drop the bullet seating die another 5,000 through, well, yeah, the next one down is 2.258. So I need to still need to bring this bullet seating die down a little over 10 thousandths, but this is enough. This is enough to, uh, to set our load data because I'm going to be making adjustments on this as we go. And some of my test loads are not compressed loads. So if we use this exact same bullet seating die setting, and seeded one of our loads with, I don't know, Vitavori N540 or AR Comp. I don't think either one of those are compressed loads. It would result in a very short overall length. So as I go from powder to powder, I basically have to loosen this, back it out a little bit and start the whole process over again to dial in that 2.246. All right, the moral of the story is, I think for our load data, which you already saw earlier in the video, I'm gonna start at, Hornet, or, uh, at Hodgson's maximum charge of 26.8 and we're gonna work up from there in three tenths of a grain increments, the exact same charge weights that we just did seeding tests with. And hopefully that'll get our velocity into a reasonable range. I, I don't know that we would really have any more room to move up. Like 28.0 grains, it did fit. We're not boogering up our bullet and it seems okay, but with a ball powder like this, it packs in there very tightly. So you go from like it's working okay to holy crap, it's really not working very quickly. So it goes from you know, compressing to solid as a rock before you know what, what's going on. So maybe we could go just a touch higher, maybe if today's results were, we just barely miss our velocity target, maybe we could cram a couple more tenths in there, but I like where we're at here. 28 grain seems to fit, doesn't seem like it's gonna cause us any problems in the loading process, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna weigh out a bunch of charges and then kind of go through this setup of seating the bullets. If anything interesting comes up, I'll flip the camera back on and let you know. I guess one thing, uh, we are going to crimp 
in this series, the factory ammo we're trying to clone, it does have a crimp. And in this series, we crimp. So maybe I'll bring you back once I've got some more charge weights weighed out and we're kind of going through the final bullet seating steps and crimping. All right, so this is the Lee factory crimp die. This is what we've used throughout this series. You can see it's got a collet down there where it just squeezes around the mouth of the case and gives you a crimp. Now we've always kept the, the crimp on these pretty light. I did a whole video about the effects of crimp and setting up this die and that sort of stuff. I'll be sure to link it at the end of the video, maybe down in the description. The setup is a little bit more art than science. What I end up doing is raising the ram and then screwing the die down while watching the collet from the top and how much it's pinching closed and all of that sort of stuff. There we go. Got it so that it's pinching down a fair amount. So I'm going to bring down the lock ring and kind of lock it in place there. So the, the five rounds that we already seated, we'll use these to set up the die. So let's just run one up in there and see what it feels like. Yeah, that didn't feel like it hit very much. Maybe just the slightest little bit of a mark on the case mouth. We want to we want to screw it down until we definitely see that case mouth getting crimped down into that ogive, or I'm sorry, into that cantalure a little bit. There we go. That's a little bit heavier. Yeah, there we go. That's done the trick just a little bit. You can see just a little bit, or maybe you can't because I suck at making videos. Let me go just a little bit farther and we'll see how that does. Yeah, that was just a little bit too much. I'm going to back it out just a smidgen. There we go. Now you can definitely see it around that case mouth. That case mouth getting collapsed down into that cantaloupe just a touch. So this was just a little bit heavier than I wanted to do. Like I said, this is a brand new set of brass that I'm just starting to use for this gun. I don't want to fatigue that case mouth too much because to be honest, in our earlier testing, I haven't really found that the crimp does a whole lot as far as affecting groups and stuff like that, it doesn't hurt anything, but it's not something we need to get the performance we're looking for, I guess, is what I'm, uh, what I'm getting at. So that's it. Our crimp die is installed and set up. Our seating die is gonna take a lot of tweaking as I switch between powders. So I'll do that off camera. I, I did settle on a uh, cartridge-based ogive measurement of 1.890. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Yep, 1.890 from cartridge base to ogive ends up with a total overall length of right about our number. So that's what I'm gonna go with. So I think that's pretty much it, folks. Let's go ahead and get out on the range. All right, folks, time to get started. I did put five shots through the gun just now to get her warmed up and woken up. Like I mentioned earlier, this gun does have the 20 inch Predator barrel from White Oak Armament. Now, what I wanna start off with is our five shots of Black Hills factory ammo, our Mark 262 factory ammo. Like I mentioned, I, I did warm up the gun, so hopefully we'll be shooting good groups right off the bat here. So five shots, let's arm the chronograph. All right, let's see what happens. Okay, so our average velocity was 2782. I expect it to be maybe just a touch higher. It is pretty cold today, so temperatures are just over 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And we found out way back in video one that this is a ball powder, you know, and they're pretty sensitive to temperature. The brass looks good. Couple shiny spots on the case heads, just like you would expect from, from some hot 556. We'll have a closer look at those later on at the bench. The group wasn't bad. I was hoping for a little bit better. Unfortunately, we threw that one up high and turned it into a 1.29 inch group. Tell you what, let's see what it, what it would have been without that third shot that went high. It should be able to go here and hide it. Yeah, so the bottom four shot into a 0.69 inch group, which is closer to you know what we would expect. So good, at least you know that gives us a baseline to work with. So it's time to move on to our own loads. First up is going to be 24.7 grains of Vitavori N540. I expect a good group here. Let's see what happens. Oh, 
Okay, so that was about 25 feet per second slower than the factory ammo at 2756. The group was a little bit better at 0.88 inches, but we kind of flew two of them to the left and two of them to the right. That, uh, yeah, I could do without that, but nothing to get too upset about. Our brass definitely had a couple shiny spots. Nothing scary, kind of like our factory ammo did. So moving right along, next up is 22.6 grains of AR comp. Okay, 2770 with a 0.95 inch group. Like I hate to complain about groups that are, you know, not bad. There's nothing wrong with a good old 0.95 inch group or a 0.88 inch group, but they just, they don't quite seem to be tr even trying to stack them in there. You know what I mean? I don't know. Now we had some more marks on the case heads there with our AR comp load. Definitely more than the factory ammo and more than we saw with Vitivori N540. Like I think I mentioned earlier in the video, AR comp and 8208 XBR, both of them are a little fast burning for this application. You know, you'd probably be better served to back off a little bit with them. Maybe shoot for 2700 or something. Okay, so that was 0.84 inches. And the grid here on the shot marker, if you're wondering, is a one MOA grid. Of course, you got the measurement up here, so I don't know that it's all that helpful, but just in case you were wondering why there's a grid today, I decided to throw up that one MOA grid, 0.84 inches, that's not bad. Velocity a little bit low at 2729, standard deviation of 9.7. The brass looked pretty good. It looked better than AR comp as far as pressure signs go, but we were also 40 feet per second slower, right? So not a huge surprise. So we're moving on to Shooter's World Match Rifle, 25.2 grains of it. All right, now that's what we're looking for. Yeah, so shot marker tells us that's a 0.61 inch group. Velocity was 27.59. Standard deviation was pretty good at 11.6. So it's all good, man. And guess what? That was the best looking brass we've seen so far. No pressure signs at all on that one. So pretty happy with that performance from Shooter's World Match Rifle. So the last of our verification loads is Alliant Power Pro Varmint, 24.8 grains of it. Let's hope we get similar performance. Tell you what, these first two velocities are crazy. That last shot was 28.59. I'm gonna run down the brass, make sure we're not getting ourselves into trouble. Yep, the brass looks just fine. All right, nice. Best group of the day, best velocity of the day. And the brass, a couple shiny spots, but nothing, nothing scary at all. 0.59 inch group. That's more like it. And that, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier where like that looks like it could be tighter. Like if we could just get rid of number four there, it could have been something special, right? You can tell the gun's wanting to group. So it kind of gives you hope that oh, a little bit of load development, we're going to be stacking them in there. Where the first couple groups of the day, it just didn't seem that way, right? It was that eh, gross shotgun pattern where they didn't even really look like they were trying to group. All right. Another thing that really surprises me about that group like after I saw those velocities, I'm like, ah, do I really want to break my cheek weld and my shooting position to get up and go chase down that brass? And, you know, as you saw, I, I did. And while I was doing that for a couple minutes, that next round was cooking in the chamber. So whenever I sat, sat back down and got my position set again, I'm like, man, I should really eject this round and move it to the end of the magazine because it's been sitting in the chamber cooking. And that didn't cause any problems. So, yeah, if you can't tell, I'm very happy. Best group of the day. And we... Had an interruption in the middle of it. Good deal. All right. I guess I could let the gun cool down. Yeah, this barrel is not the least bit warm. <laughs> yeah, I figured it might need a break, but I'm not even going to worry about it. Let's just move straight on to our Stayball 6.5 testing. Now, hopefully this isn't too confusing, but you remember those first five bullets that we seeded where we were testing to see what sort of max charge weight we wanted to run. 
I don't want to include those in the group, in the groups, because that was a different, you know, seating dies set up or, you know, adjustment. So I want to use these as just some preliminary test, uh, pressure testing. So we're going to shoot one shot of each of our charge weights here and just see what happens, starting with 26.8 grains. And this way, if we don't see any pressure signs at all on these first five shots, then, you know, maybe we don't have to freak out so much about it as we're working our way up and we can kind of relax and focus on shooting groups. All right, let's see what this first velocity is. Wow, extremely low, 2578. And of course, at those sorts of numbers, no pressure to speak of here. I was afraid this might be the case, but man, I thought we would be at least in the 2600s. Let's see what 27.1 grains does. Yeah, I might, I might have spoke too soon. That's already up to 2630. And the brass looks fine. Next up, 27.4. Okay, that one was 25.16, so we seem to have velocities just flopping all over the place on us here. 27.7 is next. So that's 26.89, and I do have a little bit of a shiny spot. I think it's probably just from the way the action is cycling. This is a very slow powder, and we're way over gassed right now. Let's finish it off here, 28.0. And that's 2715 and the brass, like there are a couple little shiny spots, but nothing we haven't seen before here today. So a little bit erratic on the velocities there. I'm afraid we're gonna, gonna be looking at some pretty big standard deviations. The funny thing is though, a freaking 4.45 inch group. <laughs> so 150 feet per second of velocity spread across those five charge waves and it still shoots into a half inch. So let's go ahead and move on. Let's shoot some groups. Okay, first up, 26.8 grains. All right, so that's an excellent start, 0 0.60 inch group. Velocity 25.99. Standard deviation 15.1. I expected that standard deviation number to maybe be much bigger, much crazier. That was 41 feet per second of extreme spread. That's not too bad. So I'm a little bit confused. So moving right along, 27.1 grains is next. All right, so that's confusing. 1.09 inch group. Our velocity only went up by two feet per second. So you, uh, you guys out there looking for velocity nodes, there you go, 2,600 feet per second. So just seems a little bit weird. All right, moving on up, 27.4. My trigger feels weird. Something's going on here. Yeah, I can't, can't even get it to go over to safe. Let me eject what's going on there. I bet we maybe blew a primer. Let me go pull, uh, find those pieces of brass. No, all the, all the primers are fine and the brass looks okay. So maybe my trigger's just being stupid. Okay, so I did find a loose primer floating around in that trigger, but it doesn't belong to anything we were shooting today. I've accounted for every piece of brass and they've all got their primer. So I don't know where the hell that thing came from. And only the primer cup came out. I think the anvil's still down in there floating around. I couldn't get that trigger back to working quickly. So I'm going to completely remove it. So I grabbed another lower. This is my Magpul UBR stocked lower. Yeah, 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 yeah you can't see it, whatever. All right, let's get this finished up. All right, so I'll gladly take that. Ended up with a 0.62 inch group. Switch stocks, switch trigger brands, went from a LaRue to a CMC trigger. So I'll take it, no complaints. And our velocity jumped up to 2643. 
those first two numbers were weird. All right, let's see what it does here on the, the uh, fourth one, 27.7 grains. Yeah, that last shot kind of screwed that one up, didn't it? Not all that much velocity increase that time either, 2660. So we only gained 17 feet per second. We might have to throw these numbers up on a chart here once we get back to the bench, see if we can see what's going on. The standard deviation numbers are not terrible, right? In the middle teens, I mean, that's kind of common. So the numbers aren't bad, it just seems like we're getting these plateaus. All right, last up, 28.0 grains. Okay, so we finished off with a 0.96 inch group. Brass didn't look bad there, so no major pressure problems today. Finished off, yeah, 0.96 inch group. Velocity up to 2696. So let's get back to the bench inside where it's warm and we'll talk all this stuff over. All right, let's start out with a look at some brass. These five pieces are from our Black Hills factory ammo. This guy right here on the end probably has the biggest mark. Yeah, just a little bit of an ejector circle there, maybe a touch of a smear. But overall, it looks really good. A couple little snake bites there on the neck of the case from the barrel extension. Pretty normal stuff. Primers are still nice and rounded at the edges. So it's good looking stuff. This is just like what we saw with our 18 inch barrel with this same ammo. Nothing to take too seriously, maybe a little nick here and there. Now over to our hand loads. The first three powders we shot, here's one of the ones with Vitivori N540. There you go, nice ejector mark and a bit of a smear there, but no significant primer flattening. Same little marks on the neck, not much else to see. I think with N540, that was really the only one. Nah, here's another one with a pretty distinct ejector mark. Here are a couple with AR comp, you know, similar sort of markings. Same thing here on this next piece. This little bit there, you know, lets us know that we're getting pretty close. 8208 XBR was the same deal. So just, you know, all kind of the same stuff there with N540, AR Comp, and 8208 XBR. But then we moved on to Shooter's World Match Rifle in row four and Power Pro Varmint in row five. There's nothing to show you. You guys see anything? I'm not seeing anything. Those two were much better. Our last five rows were our Stayball 6.5 loads. And there were one or two, like here's our, the max charge we shot, 28.0 grains. Yep, a little bit of a, little bit of a mark there on that guy, but primers look good and nothing to freak out about. Like I think I mentioned on the range, especially with the higher charges of Stayball 6.5, the gun was way over gassed. Like these were getting ejected almost straight forward. And I do not have an adjustable gas block on this gun yet. I actually bought one for it when I first bought the barrel, but just never installed it because White Oak Armament includes a gas block with the barrel and I wanted to give it a try. And it is a really smooth shooting gun, even with when suppressed. Like, you know, most of the, the common powders we shoot in 223, it's been really smooth. But I think this is one of the first like really slow burning powders that we've tried in it and it was way over gassed. It really needed, uh, yeah, it needed that gas turned down a little bit to be shooting suppressed with a powder this slow. So some of that markings and stuff might have just been from that rather than pressure. You know what I'm saying? That can happen. So I think that's enough as far as brass goes. So in the end, we found some pretty decent accuracy today. I was a little bit worried to start off with. The factory ammo shot a 1.29 inch group with that one shot going high, but something I thought of later, like I mentioned, those were the last five rounds left in this box. And I remember in an earlier video, I had sorted some of the rounds in this box and we had picked out some that had, I think we were sorting them by cartridge-based ogive measurement, th that sort of thing. W what I'm afraid of is those last five pieces that were left in here were kind of the rejects of the box. You get what I'm saying? So four out of the five shot good. They shot into a 0.6 something, but that one that went high, you know, it is what it is. Maybe that's one that early on we had sorted out because it had a funky cartridge based ogive number. I don't know, but this has been awesome shooting ammo and that's probably one of the biggest five shot groups we've shot with it, but it is what it is.
The most important thing was to get that velocity baseline, right? We got 2,782 feet per second out of the factory ammo. And most of our clone loads fell short. Like actually everything except Power Pro Varmint fell short of that 2782 number. But that's okay. This is not an exact science, you know, like it's weather's going to affect things. The different barrel length with the different powder burn speeds are going to affect things. They were all pretty good. 8208 XBR was a little bit low down at 2729. But what I found looking back in one of the earlier videos, the original charge weight I had come up with for 8208XBR and AR comp, I was just getting more pressure signs that I wanted and we had backed it down in a previous video. So the charge we shot today was actually three tenths of a grain lower than our true clone load that we had come up with in an earlier video. So that kind of explains those two, but AR comp was still 2,770 feet per second. The groups were good for the most part. I was very disappointed to see N540, AR Comp, and 8208XBR start off with those groups that were around 0.9 inches when those three were the powders I was expecting the best groups with. But Shooter's World Match Rifle and Power Pro Varmint saved the day. Both of those shot right at 0.6 inches. That's good stuff. Very happy with those numbers. On to Stayball 6.5, I was happy to see it shoot a couple good groups. That first and the third group were both 0.6 inches. The second one was a little bit ugly, and then the last two weren't all that impressive, but it wasn't bad, right? Compared to the other groups we shot with the other powders, like it wasn't like Stayball 6.5 was a terrible shooting powder for us. We just, we fell short on velocity. And speaking of velocity, let's have a look at a chart. These are our five different charge weights we shot today. The red dot is the average velocity for each of those charge weights, and then the blue dots are the individual shots. That velocity not moving much there between 26.8 and 27.1 was pretty weird. And then 27.4 and 27.7 were pretty close to one another. So I think it's, it's hard to draw too much of a conclusion with only five shots. And, you know, this isn't the first time we've ever seen this where, you know, a powder kind of seems to plateau in certain charge weight ranges. And a lot of people look for that, you know, that's kind of their primary focus of their load development is finding forgiving charge weight ranges where velocity doesn't change very much. But if this were a load I was really gonna try and nail down, I would want to repeat this test, put more rounds through the gun, get more, you know, more data to work with before I came to a final conclusion. Velocity was just a little bit low, kinda of like we expected, right? We made it up to 26.96 at 28.0 grains. We're lagging a little bit behind a lot of other powders and it just, you know, it is what it is. The powder's a little bit too bulky for this application. And that's okay. Like I said, 90s, 95s, it might be the perfect powder to give you that nice full case and get excellent velocities. But here with the 77, we just don't quite have enough case capacity. I'm looking forward to trying Stayball 6.5 in 224 Valkyrie. I think it's gonna be outstanding for that. I think we're gonna have a similar issue in Grendel that we had today in 223, like 6.5 Grendel. I think we're gonna run out of case capacity in that cartridge before we really get any superior velocities, but we're gonna try it in the Grendel eventually. And at some point we'll actually get around to testing it in 6.5 Creedmoor. It's, it's, it's an interesting powder, it really is. And we, we've got a whole lot more testing to do with it as far as temperature stability goes, because that's its big selling point, right? It's supposed to be the world's first temperature stable ball powder. And we did a video testing that and the results were kind of okay. And we're gonna be testing that more in the future and that's kind of another reason for today's video, because now I have a, a load we can test for temperature sensitivity. You know, maybe this 26.8 grains, the, the, the first load we shot today with it. In a future video, I'll probably be testing this combination to see if it's stable across temperatures. Another thing, back to like the velocities today, how some of our previous loads missed the velocity target. A few of these I switched primers. Earlier on in the series, we were shooting some of the Remington seven and a half primers and switching to the CCI number 41s. I don't know, maybe that was a factor as well. I'm not sure. We weren't that far off, right? It's not something to freak out about here, but it makes you wonder. So I think that's pretty much it, folks. I'm glad you could join me. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time.